Recently, I went on an adventure, hiking and painting in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, exploring the stomping grounds of my favorite artists from the early 19th century movement known as the Hudson River School. I filmed the whole adventure and received a lot of great feedback on the videos. Thank you if you were someone who watched one, uh, liked the video, left a comment, any of that. I posted them over the course of a few months this past year, and I thought it might be kind of fun to combine those videos into one longer film documenting the trip. So to kick it off, if you don't know, what is the Hudson River School? Well, let's find out. Now by Hudson River School, I don't really mean a conventional school. That's a common misconception a lot of people have. The Hudson River School was a group of like-minded artists that came together in the mid-19th century to form the first truly American art movement. But before we get too far down the road there, let's talk about what was going on in American art before this time period. In the time period after the Revolutionary War, artists in the country were really just trying to find their identity. If you were a decent artist at all, there were no art schools here, so you had to go to Europe to get your training. And since that's where a lot of your patrons were, most of the time people just stayed over there. The art that was being created in the United States at that time were things like colonial genre pictures, uh, portraits, things like that. Things that weren't really very distinctive and, and they didn't stand out. In fact, Europeans at the time would openly mock American artists saying, oh, you don't have any culture, you don't have any history to draw from. Um, basically, you guys are pure amateurs over there. However, good old USA did have something that Europe didn't have, and that was seemingly endless miles of untouched wilderness. This whole thing got started by a young artist named Thomas Cole, who ironically, immigrated with his family from England over to the United States. Although he did some portrait painting to start off with, he knew that if he was going to make a name for himself, he would really have to do something unique. So he got on a ship, headed north up the Hudson River uh, to explore the mountains, the forests, the rivers, and sketch everything that he saw. He took all the material from his sketchbooks and he developed them into three finished studio paintings that he talked a store owner in New York City to put on display in the window. Now it just so happened that one of the most influential people in the New York City art world at the time walked past and saw these really unique, different, wild looking landscapes and a light bulb went off. Here it was. This was the thing that was going to make the Americans at the time stand out from their European counterparts when it came to art. They knew that they had to find this young artist and learn more about it. This new idea that a landscape not a history painting, not figurative or portrait work, uh, but landscape could stand out as primary subject matter uh, was a new thing and it caught fire. And all of a sudden, a lot of other artists started to dabble in landscape work as well. Artists were traveling to locations in the Northeast, such as Niagara Falls, the Catskill Mountains, the Adirondacks, the White Mountains in New Hampshire, the coast of Maine, to search out new and exciting subject matter. Thanks to a couple of organizations who had big exhibitions every year, such as the National Academy of Design and the Art Union, patrons from all over the Northeast started to gobble up these paintings and purchase them as they represented America's vast potential as the country was eyeing westward expansion. Now, artists were competitive and always in search of bigger, more dramatic, epic source material, and so they started to branch out from the Northeast, and the second generation of Hudson River School artists, such as Frederick Church, Albert Bierstadt, would go places uh, like South America and Ecuador and the American West and the Sierra Nevada Mountains and the Rocky Mountains and up to the Arctic, uh, all over the place in search of awesome subject matter. And not only would the artists be producing great artwork from these trips, but these were true adventure-filled trips. I mean, think about it. If you're going to Ecuador in the 1850s or going across the United States in an overland coach to the Rocky Mountains in the 1860s, I mean, this is Indiana Jones type stuff. Artists and their expedition crews would send trip updates back to the local newspapers on the East Coast and they would publish their stories, which would just make the, the public even more excited to see what these artists came up with when they got back. 
Often after artists were done with their trips in the spring, in the summer, in the fall, they would head back to their New York studios in the winter and they would work up all of their sketches into these enormous paintings. And these pieces were then often put on display in huge exhibitions in the spring that the public just flocked to. By the late 19th century, tastes in art began to change and the younger, progressive artists weren't quite as interested in American scenery. If you think about it, by this time period, much of the country had been explored and settled and interest started to shift more toward French Impressionism in everyday genre scenes. The Hudson River School, as it was known, began to fade from prominence as an art movement. Overall, the Hudson River School did a ton for the United States and not just in the art world. Yes, it was America's first truly unique artistic movement, but it also provided a lot of self-confidence to a country that needed it. It inspired Western expansion and even played a big role in establishing the future national park system. It's my favorite art movement and it is a big inspiration for me to get out and go do some plein air painting. Now, if you don't know what plein air painting is, it simply means doing a painting in the open air or outdoors on location. In order to do it properly, you got to have the right equipment. Here's what I took with me on my trip. So let's go ahead and take this pack off and I'll show you what's inside. Speaking of packs, let's go ahead and start with the pack itself. Now the pack that I'm using for this trip is called the Endurex Extra Large Camera Bag. That's right, a camera bag, not necessarily a hiking backpack. When I go out and plein air paint on location, most of the time I'm not only painting, uh, I'm also filming. If I were just painting, I could get away with taking a much lighter setup, but I've got my cameras, my tripods, and yada yada yada. This bag helps me take it all with me. Now when you look at it, right from the get-go, the thing that you notice is its rugged design. It's a pretty tough backpack and it's really durable. There's a lot of storage space, which I love. Along the face of the pack, you've got three main storage compartments here. The first one is great and it's got this hard case on it. And I like to use it for carrying my essential things uh, that I need to grab quickly. So I might have a couple of granola bars in here. Uh, I'll have maybe a map and compass if I'm going somewhere that's a little more rugged. My first aid kit and an emergency po poncho just in case I need it. Behind this space, there's actually a pretty large space back behind there where I've got a number of things. Starting with this little flap right here, this is where I keep my Peshad palette. Let's get the other things out of there as well and I'll show you what I got. So in that big pocket, I've got a few different things. I already mentioned my Peshad palette. Now, this is the palette that I'm gonna be using as my main palette for the trip. Now, if you've watched any of my previous videos released here in the last six months, you'll know that I love my Peshad palette. Made by Michael Klein, this little palette fits into a leather case made specifically for it. And it pops out of there just like that. And I can open it up. And if I really want to, I can just use it as a standalone painting easel and go really light, just anchoring my canvas to the back plate here with my magnets and use this as a mixing surface. For this trip, I'm going the traditional easel route and I'm just gonna hold it like this while I paint. If you wanna see a full review of the Peshad palette and all of the features, I'll link a review video that I did a while back in the description below. So make sure you check that out after this video. Other than my Peshad palette, I've got some paper towels that I'll keep in there so I don't have to take a full roll, a few GoPro accessories. Um, I'll take my sketchbook, which I did a review video on this as well, uh, and some tape. And finally, I have what's probably my most important item in my bag, which is my little plein air kit. This plein air kit is where I keep the bulk of my supplies. So when I open it up, the first thing that I have in here are my brushes, my pencil, my palette knife, um, things like that that I'm going to use quite a bit. In the second pocket on this side, I've got a few emergency paper towels just in case I run out or if I just want to take this kit with me. Nothing else. I've got a viewfinder in case I need it. 
some tape, some extra lead for the pencil, and of course all of my paint and solvent and medium. Honestly, I have quite a bit more room in there. I could put a lot more stuff in there, like extra snacks, water, um, supplies, whatever, if I really wanted to. And then on the outside of this hard part here, there are some bungees that I could put a jacket or a sweatshirt or something like that. Moving down the bag, you've got a couple pockets here as well. Now the one in front is just simply the rain fly, which I actually really love because if I'm out uh, and it starts raining or pouring, I can put that on my bag and protect all of my gear, which is great. And then this little pocket right here works great. Um, as you can see, I don't have a lot in it, but it's got this little mesh area that I can put memory cards, extra batteries, things like that, pens, pencils, maybe a little notepad. And I've got my white balance card sitting uh, in the back. And then this is really cool. There's actually space for a small tripod that can hook in right here. But the real neat thing is back behind this. If we unzip this big space here, you'll see that there's actually room for a camera bag. Now, when I'm out in the field filming, I'm not taking a lot of camera equipment with me, but I do like to take my little Sony ZV-1, which is my main camera, as well as a GoPro, and then again, maybe a few extra accessories. And this little camera bag protects it really well. And um, I love the fact that if I want to, I can take it out of here, and then I've got a ton of extra space um, if I'm just gonna hold the camera the whole time for uh, extra, clothes, jackets, water, food, I mean, you name it, tons of room. Then of course, there's a standard water bottle holder there on the side, each side actually. And this is another cool feature, since it's a camera bag, it's designed to hold a big tripod on the side, which is perfect for painting. Now this is my heavy duty plein air tripod that I use along with my panel holder that goes with my day tripper easel. However, on this trip, I'm keeping the day tripper at home. I'm just gonna set the easel up with the panel holder and hold my Peshad palette and do paintings like that. Um, I just thought it would be good to keep the extra weight of the Day Tripper palette at home. And last but certainly not least, we need something to paint on, right? Well, the side of the backpack actually has this cool little hidden compartment that I think is designed for laptops, but it works great for me to put my panel pack panel holder in along with my canvases. So um, I just keep it in there and then wrap it up in this when I'm done so that uh, they don't get all over the place. This gear really served me well on my trip and got the job done. Once I got out to the Catskill Mountains in the Hudson River Valley of New York, I knew exactly where my first stop was going to be. We're not gonna go see just any waterfall today. We're gonna go see Catterskill Falls, which was one of the first big natural tourist attractions in America. It was made famous when Washington Irving included it in his well-known story, Rip Van Winkle, which drew a lot of people from the city and surrounding areas to the Catskills to go check it out. Soon, news spread about how beautiful and scenic it was, and of course that brought out the artists, including our guy, Thomas Cole, who started the Hudson River School movement. Now believe it or not, Catterskill Falls is New York State's tallest waterfall. That's right, even taller than Niagara. Uh, it's about 260 feet tall, and what's really cool about it is it's a two-tiered waterfall, meaning that there's a big waterfall at the top, and then a pool, and then another waterfall. You'll see. This is the top of Catterskill Falls. Now, Thomas Cole did paint a famous piece right from this spot. However, because it's a little windy and just rained, so the rocks are slippery, I'm gonna head back down below instead. There's been a lot of people that have fallen off this ledge because they got too close and died, so I don't want to be one of them. But it certainly is beautiful.
Now the goal for today is to do two paintings. One inspired by Thomas Cole's um, view from behind the upper waterfall uh, in 1826. And then I'd also like to try and get a front facing shot of the waterfall inspired by Sanford Gifford's version as well as another Thomas Cole version. All right, here it is. Wish that I could stay. Wish for this moment to never go away. But it's all in my mind. And though I know that there is nothing to find. You're a beautiful sight in the summer night. And you can't put up a fight in the misty light. Oh my gosh, those steps about killed me on the way up. <laughs> now, let's go to the middle ledge. Let's see what that looks like. All right, so it's pretty loud, but the spot that I want to get to is behind this waterfall. So essentially what I need to do is just get on this trail, walk down that way, and the spot that Thomas Cole painted from is right over there. Well, this may not be it exactly, but it's pretty darn close. Check it out. All those steps, I think I might sit down for this one. This 
vision that I saw is getting closer every dawn. Ooh, we are dreamers of the shore. The thing I worry about with this one is that I'm completely in the shade, and sometimes that can make it a little bit harder to get your values right because everything's dark. So. Uh, I have a pretty good line on my palette, so hopefully I'll be able to wing it and it will turn out. I don't know. We'll see. The water is like falling down in these like bales. It's really interesting. When I saw Thomas Cole's original painting, I thought it looked kind of strange, but now I get it. Wow, that was definitely a highlight of the trip for me. I had read about this waterfall countless times and seen lots of pictures of it, and I've even hiked there once before, but that was my very first time painting there, and hopefully not the last. Hey, real quick, if you're enjoying this video so far, I would really encourage you to hit like and subscribe to my channel and share it with your friends and family. Uh, you know, it really only takes a second to do. It's free and it really helps my channel get seen by more people. After Catterskill Falls, my next stop was to visit the home of Thomas Cole, which is now a National Historic Site. Who was he? Well, let's find out. What's crazy is that Thomas Cole wasn't even from America. He was actually an Englishman whose family moved here when he was only 17. Born in 1801, he and his family were smack dab in the middle of the Industrial Revolution in England, and they soon found themselves out of work. When Cole's family immigrated to Ohio for a fresh start in 1818, he knew he had to help out with the finances. He started out as an engraver, but a traveling artist in the community sparked his interest in painting, and that led him into trying out portraiture. He was self-taught, and as he wandered around Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York looking for commission opportunities, he couldn't help but notice the beautiful, untouched wilderness around him. What a stark difference from the manicured pastures and towns he grew up in over in the UK. In 1825, he took a trip up the Hudson River that would change his life and the course of American art for the next 50 years. He explored the Catskill Mountain region of the Hudson River Valley and filled sketchbooks with drawings of dramatic cliffs, waterfalls, lakes, and trees. He turned these sketches into five paintings that were displayed in a bookshop window in New York City. These paintings attracted the attention of influential artists and patrons such as engraver Asher Durand, artist John Trumbull, William Dunlap, and Henry Wadsworth. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. Instead of copying old themes from Europe, here was an artist who was making America's vast wilderness his star subject. They quickly purchased Cole's paintings and his career took off from there. He took more trips to upstate New York and New England looking for fresh subject matter. Commissions began rolling in and he kept busy. He was a steady exhibitor at the annual National Academy of Design and Art Union shows in New York City. 
His work was really influential for many young artists at the time, and his focus on American landscape gave the United States its first true artistic identity. In fact, one of his only students was the young Frederick Church, who would go on to become one of the most famous American artists in the 19th century. Eventually, he settled in the small town of Catskill, New York, right on the banks of the Hudson River, and married Maria Bartow in 1836. They lived at Cedar Grove, a working farm with orchard and crops, with a beautiful view of the Catskill Mountains to the west. The home is now open for tours and is a national historic site. Cole was best known for his allegorical painting series. He was a deeply spiritual man and often used landscape as a vehicle for much more heady themes. A great example of this is his famous series, The Course of Empire. Personally, this is one of my favorite series of work that he did. At the time of its creation, from about 1833 to 1836, the wild areas around coal started to disappear as the land was cultivated. Worried that the very thing that made America unique was vanishing, Cole created this series of paintings as a kind of warning to the country. The first painting, titled The Savage State, depicts a wild landscape. Cole played it up by adding dramatic clouds, a sunset, natives and primitive hunters chasing after deer. A prominent mountain appears in the distance that really kind of creates that wilderness vibe. The second painting, The Arcadian or Pastoral State, shows the same landscape except now it's a lot more calm. We can see shepherds with their sheep, what looks like a temple of some sort, indicating organized religion is happening, and a town along the water's edge. The cut down trees in the bottom corners of the painting symbolize man's domination over nature. In the third painting, the consummation of empire, civilization has completely taken over. Massive Greek and Roman style buildings dominate the scene as hordes of people fill the streets. Our cliff still peeks out in the background as humanity is seemingly at its peak. But all good things must end. Power, greed, and the innate selfishness of human nature take over and result in war. In the fourth painting, Destruction, you can see things aren't looking so great. A battle is happening and violence is everywhere. People are being slaughtered, buildings are on fire, and chaos erupts. Bodies fill the fountain in the right foreground and dead children lie on the steps as a woman is pulled down by her hair. Scary stuff. Finally, in the fifth painting, Desolation, everything is quiet. No more war, no more people. All that's left is ruins. The moon rises as we see our mountains still standing in the background. Things have come full circle and nature is beginning to overtake the ruins and things are returning to a wild state. Wow, what a series. What do you think? Leave a comment below and give me your opinion. For me, this is a powerful set of paintings, a true masterpiece. His warning to America back in the 1830s, I think still holds true today. Cole loved paintings that had a moral lesson to them and did several more with big themes. In his later work, he wasn't even all that concerned about reproducing exactly what he saw in nature, but he used it as a starting point to tell his narrative. This rubbed some artists at the time the wrong way who thought his work was turning too sentimental and not being truthful enough to the subject matter, but what do you do? Cole died in 1848 at a young age from pleurisy, a respiratory condition that sprung up suddenly. He was immediately seen as one of the most important artists, if not the most important, that artists had produced at that time and was mourned around the nation. A pretty important guy, to say the least. Let's actually head over to his home, Cedar Grove, in the town of Catskill, and do a little bit of painting on the property. Today I'm at Cedar Grove, which is the home of Hudson River School founder Thomas Cole. You can in fact see his house uh, over my shoulder there back behind me. The site is now a national historic site. You can get tours through the home, visit a uh, reconstruction of his new studio, see a bunch of his original work, and learn more about his life. So I brought my painting stuff and I thought today we'd go do a little bit of plein air painting on the property. Let's go.
Also, I like how the house is kind of hidden by these three trees in front. Um, count this one over here. This one right here, the big one, um, is I think the tree that's in this painting here of, of the Cole family at their house. Now, of course, this isn't done by Cole himself, but uh, fascinating nonetheless. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and get this part of the house. Probably won't get the right side of it. Um, almost as though it's just kind of peeking out. It's cloudy today, so I don't know if um, the sunshine is going to cooperate, but let's see what happens. There's a fine line. You want to add enough detail that it is characteristic of the house, but not so much that you get bogged down in it and the piece falls apart. Now you might be sitting there thinking, what about the railings? Don't worry, those are going on next. drops of rain so the rest of this might have to be a little on the sketchy side. ever in the area, make sure you check it out and book a tour. Well worth it. The National Park Service has even added some really amazing multimedia elements to the tour that made it really unique and different than other house tours I've done before. It really helps bring Cole's work to life. Only a few minutes away from his property lies Catskill Creek. Let's go over there now and check it out. I'm at Mawignac Preserve. Hopefully I said that right, uh, which is right next to Catskill, New York, and it's right along the banks of Catskill Creek. Now, Catskill Creek was one of the favorite uh, painting uh, subjects of Hudson River School founder Thomas Cole, who happened to live right here in Catskill. In fact, in writings, he called it his favorite haunt and painted it over a dozen times. So I thought that we would take a little stroll on the trail and see what we can find. Maybe we'll do a painting. Wow. 
now you empty out of the woods into this beautiful meadow clearing. Now what's interesting is this is mostly a uh, forest preserve today, but back in Cole's day in the 1830s and 40s when he was most active at this site, it was actually pretty cultivated. So a lot of the trees had been cleared and this was mostly farmland, much to Cole's disappointment. He actually wrote about how he hated seeing the natural wild feel of the area start to disappear. Um, and he even did some depictions of the train coming through the area to kind of show how the land was changing over. In fact, a lot of people thought the entire Catskill region was going to be completely um, cut down and mowed away uh, within 50 years. Fortunately, people stepped in to preserve the location and it's actually uh, much more wild than it was back in Holes day. Well, I found the creek, although I have to admit it's maybe not quite as scenic as I thought it might be. I mean, a lot of Cole's paintings show the mountains in the background and, you know, a lot of that he might have just ad-libbed together. Um, but you certainly can't see that here. And again, it's pretty, but it looks like uh, any old Midwestern stream, I guess, which is fine. But, you know, there was a spot uh, on the drive down here that looked really interesting. Um, it might be worth checking out and I've got about an hour and a half or so. So maybe that'll be enough time to squeeze out a quick painting. I don't know, let's go find out. All right, let's head back to the car and see if we can find that other spot. Okay, not as glamorous, but this is a view that I know Cole painted a few different times and you have a better spot. We're a little bit higher up on the creek. I don't even know if I'm gonna have time to pre-mix my colors like I normally do. I'm just gonna have to get something down fast. mountains are really distinct and characteristic so you got to make sure you get the shapes right. Oh man, just a little bit of a glow left. Well, I felt a little rushed trying to get that one done before the sun went down. Sunsets are a really big challenge if you've ever tried them before because things are constantly changing. The colors, the lighting, um, it's a little stressful. I don't know if that was necessarily the best painting I've done, but I hope I did Thomas Cole proud. Another prominent Hudson River School artist who lived in the area was Frederick Church. It just so happens that his home, 
Olana is also preserved by the state of New York as a historic site, and it sits just across the Hudson River from Cedar Grove. Let's check that one out. What's up guys, Cody here with Found Atelier, and today I am at beautiful Olana. What is Olana, you ask? Well, Olana is the home and property of a famous 19th century Hudson River School artist, Frederick Church. It's a large property of around 250 acres or so right along the Hudson River. The crown jewel of Olana is the mansion itself. So in the early 1870s after church and his family took a trip to the Middle East, they came back and built this Persian slash Moorish style mansion. And it is gorgeous with some amazing views of the Hudson River Valley and uh, the Catsco Mountains beyond. In fact, truth be told, this is my second trip to Olana. I made a trip uh, a few days ago here and did a painting, filmed the whole thing, and to be honest, I completely deleted it all. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm back for more. All right, well, enough blabbing by me. Let's go do some painting. All right, well, I'm gonna settle on the view from Church's front porch looking south down the Hudson. This is a view that he painted many times, probably from this exact location of the porch or the little um, piazza right over there. Here's a little tip for when you're plein air painting. Be mindful of what you're wearing when you paint. For instance, today, I'm wearing this bright red shirt, which honestly is not the best choice, but I need to go do laundry. The color of your shirt will reflect on your canvas when you get close to it, and that can influence the way things look. So if you can wear a neutral toned shirt, that really is the best way to go. That's why in a lot of my planner vlogs you'll see me wearing gray um, kind of a drab green brown something like that uh, you can really see it on the canvas here when I get close watch and see if you can see it warm up back away to get close so I'll just have to be careful to not get too close while I'm painting all right let's get to it That definitely happens from time to time when you're outside.
was such a cool experience. Frederick Church is my personal favorite artist, so it was really special to get to spend so much time on his property. From there, I went out looking for a little bit more adventure, and I would definitely find it at my next stop. Hey guys, Cody here with Bount Atelier, and today I am in the Platte Clove Preserve in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York. Now, if you don't know what a clove is, I didn't know what a clove is, a clove is a narrow gorge kind of running up into the mountains. Platte clove, the one I'm in right now, was known to be extremely rugged and hard to access. Everything that I read uh, does say that you have to be extremely careful on this trail. Uh, it gets very narrow and there's steep drop-offs. People have died in this area because they've wandered off the trail and fell off a cliff. So uh, we're gonna have to be really careful. All right, well, it looks like <clears throat> there might be a view here. Whoa, that's the clove. So this is an actual stop on the Hudson River Art Trail. And as you can see, this location was painted by Asher Grant, which is pretty cool. Pretty fascinating stuff. I recommend that you pause this, that way you can read, read this. This is pretty cool. All right, well, I've seen several signs now that talk about how dangerous the central part of this clove is. So I guess we'll find out. I don't know if you can see it, there is definitely a waterfall right over there. See if this trail goes down to it. All right, well, that's pretty impressive. And what's awesome is I have the whole place to myself. All right, well, I'm gonna go explore down the creek just a little bit. Now there's a lot more waterfalls as it tumbles down the cove, so I'll have to be careful. I wanna try and find a good painting spot though. I can only imagine the early explorers and artists who came up to these cloves, you know, there was no road for them to just come up. Uh, you know, they had to basically climb up these streams and creeks and waterfalls. It's incredible. All right, well, it starts to get pretty thick back in here and the trail continues along this clove, but it's getting harder and harder to see. So what I might do is actually head back to one of those first spots that I ran across. I really loved the area where the water uh, from that first waterfall was going over the edge. So I might head back that direction and paint that. Let's go. So quick change of plans. I actually met a local couple uh, passing me on the hiking trail named Bruce and Susan and they were super nice and they invited me to come with them to show me a uh, the base of a big waterfall and they showed me how to get there safely. I'm not going to say exactly where it's at because I don't want anyone to come down here. It is pretty dangerous if you try and do it by yourself. But uh, yeah, let's do some painting.
Well, it's not supposed to rain today, but those clouds are a little concerning and this is probably not a place that I want to get stuck if it does rain. So uh, I think I'm going to just stop this one right here and finish it from photos that I took while I was down here. And I'll see you guys back up at the top. came up right through there. All right, well that was certainly an adventure. Uh, all fours, rock scramble to get up that last steep part, but I made it. That was a lot of fun. As I said, I'll finish the sketch that I started down there from my photos a little bit later. Now, I'm not gonna lie, that one was a little nerve wracking. One of the things I didn't mention in that video was just a few weeks prior to me being there, someone had actually slipped and fell in the creek above that waterfall that I was painting at, and unfortunately she washed over the edge and didn't make it. Search and rescue had to rappel down the side of that cliff that I went down in order to recover her body. I think knowing that added a little bit to my anxiety about being down there, but I got out with only a few scrapes and bruises, so I'm pretty grateful. Another adventurous spot in the same area was known as Sunset Rock. This is a viewpoint along a trail near the famous Catskill Mountain House, which was a resort on the edge of a cliff with some really dramatic views. Unfortunately, the resort is long gone. It burned down in the 60s, but Sunset Rock is definitely still there. During this particular painting, I had to battle some really strong winds that nearly blew me off the mountain. Uh, it was weird because down below at the lake, uh, it wasn't windy at all, but once we got up um, above the trees, I had to work really quick in order to get out of there because a storm was coming in, as you'll see in the video. Let's see how it turned out. What's up guys, Cody here with Fount Atelier, and today I'm going to hunt down another famous Hudson River School vantage point, Sunset Rock. Sunset Rock sits just north of North South Lake, uh, up on a prominent point and overlooks the lake and then you can see the Hudson Valley below. It was a super popular spot in the 19th century for tourists to go run up to and see, so we're going to go check it out and maybe do a little bit of painting. Let's go. All right, well, looks like we're gonna do a little bit of climbing. I'm telling you, this is a lot steeper than it looks on camera, and it just rains, so it's a little slippery. Let's see what happens. Looks like there might be kind of a cool ledge right over here. Let's go see if we can get a view. Look at that cloud right down there. The Hudson River back behind. The Berkshires of Massachusetts in the distance. Beautiful. So it's really hard to believe that this isn't even the view yet. We're still going. All right, so while I'm hiking, why do I do these videos? What's the point? Well, three reasons. Number one, I love being outside. Grew up outside, hiking, Eagle Scout, all of the above, it's great. Anytime I can be outside, I'll do it. Number two, these specific, specific videos, I'm looking at the, or 
exploring the Hudson River region, stepping in the footsteps of my favorite artists. And number three, maybe the most important one, is I know there's a lot of people that watch these that have never plein air painted before. They've never done any sort of artwork outside. And I hope that videos like these will be an inspiration for them to get out and try it themselves. Of course, I had to go up a really rocky section as I'm telling you this. All right, I think we are getting close. Set the trails right through here. Over here maybe? This is a pretty open vantage point. Might have hit the jack. Well, this is definitely it. Now I'll have to see if I can make a painting without blowing away. Holy cow! Windy. I don't know if you can hear me, but it's so windy. I might just have to do a small handheld one. Kind of just below the rock. I'm trying to hide behind the rock here and mix. This is extreme plenary, huh? It's all right. I drove 1,200 miles. I'm gonna do my painting, darn it. Hopefully, uh, all of this moving in doesn't mean trouble. Better hurry up. struck by lightning on Sunset Rock. I better hurry. All right, feeling good about where it's at. Got the lake in, raindrops are coming down. Let's get this rock in uh, the foreground here and call it a day. Definitely rain, so yep, let's get out of here. Hey, I'll take it, all things considered. To wrap things up, I spent time at a historic resort that is still standing, the Mohonk Mountain House. Now, this is an absolutely stunning place. Staying there, however, was just a little outside of my budget, so I had to hike in to enjoy the sights. Today I'm doing something I've always wanted to do. It's on my bucket list of places to check out and that is the Mohonk Mountain House. Now the Mohonk Mountain House is a historic mountaintop resort near New Paltz, New York. 
It was established in 1869 and is on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, it's really picturesque. All the pictures I've seen uh, are beautiful. So I brought all of my painting gear and uh, I'm gonna go spend the day there doing some hiking and painting. So let's go. I think it's funny if you're a hiker they are serious about you not actually going into the mountain house itself it's reserved for the high paying guests only i've seen that in multiple spots now when you check in at the hiking gatehouse they give you these very fashionable red bracelets that tell people that you paid but also tell people to not let you in the building so far i've came along this path with the red arrows and i'm right here so it looks like i'm eh, maybe a little bit less than halfway. I could continue along this path to get to the mountain house, or there's this little path right here called the Fox Path. Looks like it could be a shortcut. The catch is that apparently the Fox Path is a rough path, whatever that means. So what do you think? Take the rough path or take the easy way? What would you do? Leave a comment, let me know. As for me, well, you only live once, so let's take the rough path. So apparently, what they mean by rough path is that we're just going to go over the mountain instead of around it. Which makes things more interesting, but still fun. Take the fox path, I said. No big deal, it'll be fun, I said. Whew. Good workout in the morning. Ah, oh, I think I made it. Now the Montauk Mountain House is in the Shangunk Mountains of New York, which are just on the southeastern-ish corner of the Catskills. Uh, they're called the Gunks for short, which I think is kind of funny. Now there were Hudson River School artists that visited the area, such as Sanford Gifford and Worthington Whitridge, although uh, some of the bigger names like Thomas Cole and Frederick Church didn't come this direction as often. I'm gonna be on the lookout for a spot called Sky Top, which is a place where uh, Sanford Gifford painted. So let's go see if we can find it. Let's go ahead and get set up and do some painting.
Well, I'm really happy with how that turned out. Now we can't be this close to the Skytop Tower without checking it out. So let's go do that before we wrap things up. Man, those views were spectacular from the top of that tower. Once I came down from the tower, I wanted to get a little bit closer to the main building and do a painting of the lake. The sun was starting to set and the lighting was perfect.
So overall, it was definitely a fun trip, and I loved the combination in that area of history, art, and the outdoors. All right, so I thought it would be kind of fun to wrap things up by sharing a few superlatives of the trip with you. First of all, what was my favorite painting I did? Well, I would have to say my hike down to Catterskill Falls and the painting that I did there was definitely my favorite one. It's such an iconic site and I really wanted to take my time and just soak in the experience. It's definitely, painting aside, one of the most impressive waterfalls that I've ever seen. My least favorite painting? Well, probably the one I did at the bottom of the waterfall in Platte Clove. I wasn't really able to finish it on location because uh, when I saw those storm clouds come over, as you saw in the video, I thought I needed to hightail it out of there. And don't get me wrong, it was really beautiful, but it was hard for me to find a good composition in that spot. The rock that I happened to be standing on wasn't very big, and the terrain around me was really rugged. It was steep. Uh, there were big boulders everywhere. Uh, and not to mention, you know, I was a little nervous about making it back up out of there after my guides left. So I don't think I was able to concentrate 100% on that painting. But, you know, you win some and you lose some. My favorite historic site. Well, I went to a lot of them while I was there, and some I didn't film at. I went to a lot of museums and things where I couldn't really set up and paint. But uh, the one that really sticks out is probably Olana, which was the home of Frederick Church. Uh, the inside of this mansion is simply amazing, and it's filled with artwork and trinkets from his travels around the world. Um, they've kept it in the same state it was as when he died. Uh, I wasn't allowed to film inside, but it's definitely worth checking out if you're ever passing through. One of the cool things is they let you do a self-guided tour in the house, which allowed me to really just kind of spend a few hours exploring at my own pace without being rushed along by a guide. And finally, my favorite hike. Well, to get to all of these spots, I had to do a lot of hiking. There really weren't many of them that were right off the road, except maybe some of the historic sites. My favorite and most unique hike that I did probably was to the Mohonk Mountain House. Now, if you're not staying the night at the resort, you're actually not allowed to park there. I had to park in a hiker lot about three miles away and hike there on a trail. So it was a good six mile round trip just to get there and back. And that does include all the hiking I did when I was there, which was pretty much all day. Uh, it was beautiful though and super well worth it. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that. And if you are still here, thanks for sticking around to the end. Remember to hit subscribe. And if you're sitting there wondering if you could do this stuff yourself, uh, make sure you visit fountatelier.com where you can learn more about my online art coaching program. I'd love to help you out. And if you want to see more plein air videos like the ones you just watched, make sure you check out this video right here.